Ladies and gentlemen, because of America's rotten ass criminal policies, they have created a new situation in prisons across America. The prisons are now officially becoming nursing homes because, see, they want to keep you in jail for astronomical years, for remedial crimes, nonviolent crimes, all kinds of stupid shit. You know, you go to jail in America, and like I said, you don't have to commit a crime to end up in jail in America. So this came out in USA Today, the graying of American prisons, when is enough enough? Never, never, because it's a money game in America. The more you stack in there, the more prison work gets done. One of Wayne Prey's earliest run-ins with the criminal justice system occurred when he was 22. He was arrested for having pills in two envelopes. At 29, he was given probation on fraud charges. By the time he was 41, he was charged as a drug king, according to court documents, in a New Jersey report that detained black organized crime in the state. In 1990, a federal judge sentenced Prey to life in prison without parole, plus three 25 year stints for, among other things, cocaine and marijuana possession and distribution. Now 71, Prey has been locked up for three decades on non-violent offenses. And see, we've been saying this forever. According to many of the white supremacists out here, these things aren't happening. The most violent criminals are in jail, which is the biggest lie ever, you know, and plus the data don't back up what you're saying. Most recently, at the federal prison in Otisville, New York. He is one of about 20,000 older federal inmates, prisoners over 55, who are among the fastest growing population in the federal system. Many of them were given life amid the war on drugs in the 1990s. See, this is why we keep telling you that people have been in jail since the crack epidemic. Their crime being a crack addict. And they're, sit, they're still sitting there. But according to everyone out here now, opioids is a public health issue and nobody should go, excuse me, go to jail, right? But when the crack epidemic was going on, every damn thing was a crime. The dealer was a criminal. The drug addicts were a criminal. Everything. A crack house, that was criminal. Now you got safe injection houses, right? A legalized crack house. But everything was a crime. There was no drug court. They get drug court. So, ladies and gentlemen, you see how convenient it is to change things when the face of the junkie changes. All of a sudden, you know, nobody's a criminal. And if you were really sincere, you would let all of those junkies from the 80s and 90s, you would let them go. That would be the humane thing to do. Oh, but no, not you. A life sentence for marijuana and cocaine. A life sentence for that, though. <laughs> yeah, okay. Believe in your system, right? Okay. Don't make me laugh. Mandatory life sentences mean a federal prison population that is graying in large numbers. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. So don't let these folks tell you that everybody in jail 
serving these long astronomical sentences are for violent crimes. They are lying. The majority of them in there that are serving these long as life sentences are for non-violent drug offenses, just like we've been telling you in the black community all along. If most of the prison population is coming out of the black community, who is going to know better than us why they are in there? Who? <laughs> okay. The people that are trying to convince you of the lie, them? Okay. This group puts the greatest financial burden on U.S. prisons while posing the lowest threat to American society. Oh yeah, that man, that old man in the picture, oh yeah, he's a major, major threat to American society. Uh-huh, yeah. Prey status and that of others aging in the system presents tough questions. How old is too old to remain incarcerated? Is Prey at 71 the same threat he was at 41? And if he isn't, then why is he still behind bars? Remember, non-violent drug offense. That's what he, he's been serving three decades over. A phone interview with Wayne Prey, also known as Akbar Prey quickly revealed that his life, like many of ours, is multifaceted. Today, he's a poet and a ferocious reader. He's considered a model citizen in prison. He mentors kids who are on the cusp of making the same mistakes he did and created a CD with important life lessons called Akbar Prey Speaks to the Streets. So the aging population is growing in prison so quickly because of the increased use of life sentences by these judges. You know, you can't exclude, when you talk about race soldiers, you cannot exclude judges. You can't exclude the juries that are still primarily predominantly white. You can't exclude the prosecutors and the cops. They are all responsible for this. You got a, a large elderly population in there for nonviolent drug offenses, a big majority of them. But we know laying the blame where it belongs, they'll all just deny it as usual. Okay, decades ago, inmates would age out of prison and in general, out of criminal behavior. Now about 40% of prisoners sentenced to life worldwide are in U.S. and more than 3,000 federal lifers from 1988 to 2016 were sentenced for drug crimes, non-violent drug crimes. Okay. If that's not the case, then how come the majority in there for this age 55 and older are in there for that reason? See, ladies and gentlemen, this is why I'm telling you, these folks don't tell the truth about anything. In order for you to know the truth, you have to dig for that truth yourself. So increase in life sentences, 2003 to 2016 with parole, 17.8%. Without parole, 59%, the majority. One in five African-American prisoners are in for life. Number of overall life sentences since 1984. Ladies and gentlemen, this is around the time of the crack epidemic. 
So now you can see on this chart, 1984, there were 34,000 people in there with life sentences. And now you see as of 2016, 161,957. And so they, they were just handing these life sentences out like water. A letter from Newark Mayor Ross Baraka, written in 2012 when Baraka was still a high school principal, describes Prey as a man who has encouraged students to be critical thinkers, responsible and accountable to their families and communities. Baraka um, is one of many people who have spoken up in support of praise, pleas for clemency, all of which have been denied. Mm -mm -mm. Lack of judicial discretion from 1993 to 1996 Nearly 800 drug offenders were sentenced to life without parole in federal prison. Again, nonviolent drug offenses. Ladies and gentlemen, never listen to these people that are telling you most people are in jail for violent crimes. Stop listening to those folks. They are telling lies. They are telling you lies. Okay, and this uh, is according to the Burden Alive Project, which track rates by year and state. That's 57% higher than during the previous four-year period. Prosecutors wield a lot of power when it comes to sentencing. It isn't uncommon for attorneys to push plea deals on defendants in exchange for information. And the rejection of those deals sometimes means elevated charges that result in mandatory minimum federal sentences, including life. That lack of judicial discretion was enough to push Kevin Sharp off the bench. He was a federal judge for six years in Nashville and was forced to hand down three life sentences all of which he disagreed. One on Chris Young, a 26-year-old who was facing drug charges. Okay, yeah. Okay. And rejected a plea deal because he wanted his day in court. The other two for Young's co-defendants. The biggest responsibility you've got as a federal judge is sentencing people taking away someone's liberty, Sharp explains during a phone interview, giving prosecutors the ability to manipulate sentencing is a recipe for abuses. And, and that's all that goes on across this country in America, especially in the urban areas. And eliminates the judge ability to act as a neutral third party who hands down sentences that are fair. We know judges don't do that in America. That keep in uh, the mind, the defendant, uh, personal and criminal history, and that way of socioeconomic factors that may lead to criminal activity. Maximum minimums, Sharp says, encourage prosecutors to overcharge people either because they are trying to extract some kind of cooperation from them or it's just vindictive. Mm, yeah, they're doing it because they are evil. The only thing that will reduce that power, he adds, is if the federal government steps in to change certain rules behind sentencing, which they will never do. This federal government has never cared about what happens in the black community. It never cared about what happens to innocent people behind bars. And it does not care about anybody that does a nonviolent drug offense and they end up with a life sentence behind that. They don't care. 
That's why they haven't changed nothing in all of these centuries. When they had a chance to change this stuff, they didn't. So they don't care. I wouldn't hold my breath waiting on the U.S. federal government for doing anything that makes sense. While the First Step Act passed by Congress last year changes mandatory minimums for some federal offenders, not all will be helped by it, including inmates such as Prey, who were convicted in cases involving powder cocaine instead of crack. Federal prisons that house larger populations of older inmates spend more met on medical costs. Yeah, I bet they do. And this is America's fault. It's America's fault. And in many cases, the higher price tag comes with standard care. Prey reports a slew of physical ailments that include arthritis and high blood pressure. He says his mental health is also something he works hard to maintain every day. When he talks about keeping his spirits up, pray sounds hopeful. When he talks about his past, it can be hard to hear remorse in his words. But as troubling as Prey's past is, Judge, Judge Claude uh, Coleman, a former director of the no uh, Newark Police Department, says the justice system gains nothing by continuing to lock him up. Coleman, who was instrumental in dismantling Prey's drug operation, says Prey was a nonviolent offender who would have had a hard time running a similar crime syndicate if he was released today. All right. I was satisfied with having dismantled his organization, Coleman said during a recent interview. We relieved him of all of his assets. Incarceration should be about reform. They don't reform these people in there either, y'all. They don't give them nothing. They just throw them in there work them to death doing all that corporate work, and then throw them back out to the streets. That's really pretty much all America does. They need you in there for long periods of time to make sure the prison work gets done from these corporations. Now it's strictly for punishment, but to punish you for the rest of your life? All right. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, just understand that these drug offenses that people are in there for, many of them get longer sentences than people that have murdered. Okay, people committing rape, we've seen them get 10 years probation, haven't we? They haven't been in jail. 10 years probation for a violent rape, right? But someone caught with cocaine, someone caught with weed, life sentence. But see, when we speak of these things, there are many out here that claims this is not happening. And we know damn well it's happening because many of us in the black community, many of us know people directly or indirectly that are in there for these nonviolent drug offenses. And... This is why I don't listen to these folks talking about, well, you know, you shouldn't do the crime. Well, that's another problem. Everybody in prison didn't do a crime. But because you got your system set up to not believe certain people and let others off that really should be in there, they, they, they will let white people walk out of courtrooms that have committed felonies and leave and go right back out to the streets. But somebody with a little bit of weed in their pocket, they're being kept in there for astronomical amounts of time. 
and all the, the decades that this has been going on, ladies and gentlemen, this federal government has never stepped up to say a damn thing. This is why I tell people, especially people that don't live here, don't listen to these folks when they tell you black people are the most violent. Just go and look at the data of what people are in jail for and you will see nonviolent drug offenses is all the way at the top. People that are in there for the most violent crimes, I don't even think it's even 10% of the prison population. I think it's more like 7%. It's a real low percentage. So you can't go by what these people have said. The ones that have historically lied for centuries, you can't go by what they say. You really can't. They're never going to tell you the truth. They're going to make up some BS off the top of their head and try to make you believe that's the truth. So, ladies and gentlemen, they now have a new problem in America. The new problem is their prisons are turning into nursing homes because they want to throw the book at people that commit nonviolent drug crimes and they want to let their felons walk. This is why you always hear people say, especially me, your most hardened criminal is the one outside of the jail. Your more <clears throat> dangerous person are out on the streets. They're the most dangerous people are out on the streets among all of us. Please tell me what you think, ladies and gentlemen. Please leave your comment and subscribe. Don't forget to hit on the notification bell and I'll see you on the next video. Peace, family.